The fourth pranayam has been mentioned in the Yoga Sutras. In the Yoga Sutras, the first pranayam is purely explained as inhalation, exhalation. They talk about um, kumbhak. And finally, one speaks about the fourth pranayam. So, what exactly is the fourth pranayam? Very mysterious. Nobody understands it. Fourth pranayam is prana itself. We have looked at our famous diagram, the circle chart where we have seen the progression from the gross to the subtle. And at that subtle most level, we have prana itself, also known as adiprana, and that is basically the fourth pranayama. So, if there is something like this, you might ask yourself, why am I not experiencing the fourth pranayama? Why don't I get a direct experience of prana itself? A lot of people say, I have been doing pranayama since three decades. I have been practicing regularly, spending hours doing practice, but still I do not experience this fourth pranayama. So, why is it that most of us are not experiencing the fourth pranayama? There are various reasons. One of the reasons and the first foremost of reasons is talent. Just like there are some people who are more talented at art and drawing and others are not. There are some who are more talented at dancing, they're more graceful. And there are others who seem to be born with two right legs and are totally clumsy. Some of us are very good at sports and the others, they just totally struggle and the only sport they seem to be good at is um, surfing channels, uh, you know, on internet. So, this is a matter of the quality of the student. Not everybody is good at this or natural at this. So there is a certain evolution process and if you have naturally evolved to find this to be the most exciting thing, there's a certain quality of that student. Not everybody has that quality. So that's the first reason. But that is not a reason to lose heart. It does not mean that if you may not be an adhikari, an absolutely natural born, you know, the ideal student, that you are never going to experience this. It's not a reason to be disheartened. If you have a good method, a systematic method, the best speedy method, as it says in the Yoga Sutras, three kinds of methods. We have very mild, there's medium, and there's speedy method. So if you have a speedy method, a method that is very effective, very efficient, that with that kind of approach, you can get some glimpses of it and maybe even be established in it. So that's a second reason. There's still another reason. Perhaps you do not have a good teacher or a guide. You don't have an appropriate overview, therefore. So, that's what you need. You need a good guide, a tradition that provides you with that kind of guidance. So, if you don't have a teacher... Joachim, can you uh, mute yourself, please? 
I'm sorry. So if you don't have that kind of guidance, uh, you will struggle, you will make mistakes. In a sense, it's a process of learning by doing, you know, learning by making mistakes. But that takes time. I say sometimes, you know, a bit tongue-in-cheek, that there are teacher's training programs and, you know, you can do a teacher's training program in like 200 hours or whatever it is, stretched over maybe a year or two years or however long they, they take. If there are better ones, might offer a 600-hour teacher's training program. For those of you who were in our last session of the Bhagavad Gita, we talked about needing at least 10,000 hours of training in a particular field if you really want to attain something, uh, mastery and something. So that's another aspect. So you need a good tradition, a good teacher who will guide you. But then you need also the consistency, the stamina to stay with that and not keep jumping from one thing to another. So that's an, a fourth reason. In our approach that we have of a lineage, is, I say, you know, this, is, this kind of training programs that we have in the oral tradition are not about 200 hour training programs or 600 hour training programs. It's a 6,000 year training program. And what does that mean? It's the lineage itself. It has already done the experimentation. You don't need to do anything, you know, by learning, by, by doing, learning, by making mistakes. No trial and error is required anymore. If you have a good teacher, a good tradition, a good method. With that, with these four ideas, you, you will understand what is required to be able to attain the fourth pranayam. But this is still not the only reason why many of us are not experiencing that fourth level of pranayama. Very often, Students are skipping the beginning, the preparation. They just want to jump to the more advanced pranayam. Everybody likes to be advanced. So it's very hard when you just skip over. We making the differentiation between breathing exercises and pranayama. But besides that, there is a different kind of preparation that's required and that preparation is about creating suitable environment how what kind of environment is required how do we prepare ourselves one is a suitable environment in terms of having privacy uh, having a bit of solitude. Um, Melly is asking me, should I see some text? Uh, I hope you're all able to see the text. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, so everybody sees the text. I don't know, Melly, if you cannot see the text, maybe mm, you need to um, drop out and rejoin, perhaps. That might help. I don't know if Joachim can help you. Joachim, perhaps you can just um, help me. Otherwise, if, if there is anything that you can yeah. do for her. Okay, okay I'll do that. Yeah. I'd like to go Mary. Hmm. Um, what does it mean, solitude? Solitude does not mean that you uh, need to retire, need to go off to the Himalayas, need to go to a retreat uh, somewhere. Of course you can do all that, but it doesn't mean that you have to give up everything and just go off 
uh, and uh, isolate yourself. Well, what it means is that you need a space, some sort of space in your house, uh, a nice room, or if you don't have an extra room for this, at least a corner in your house that is, you know, has some fresh air, it's, it's not uh, in a very noisy area, where, where you can be undisturbed. And creating that environment, organizing your life around this. Uh, Jorgen, can you mute yourself again, please? So creating this environment is uh, not always easy. I know I get very often messages from people who says, oh, I'm not being supported by my family. Uh, is this an issue? And I say, yes, you need to have a kind of um, agreement with your family and explain to people why this is important for you and uh, have a kind of a contract where you say, okay, give me this time and I do the things that are my duties in the family at other times, you know, but just if I can have that time to do my practice. So creating the environment in the family, in the house, apart from having a space and a room is, of course, um, what is meant by creating a suitable environment. Another thing for pranayama is something that can be uh, often beyond our control, and that is a good quality of air. When we start doing pranayams, and the process of cleansing, purification for certain pranayams like the Kapalabhatis, Bhastrika, uh, as we start elongating the breath, there are many, uh, you know, higher um, like counts or for a longer period of time, you're going to increase the intake of air. If this air is extremely polluted, it will compound the Ill, Ill effects of air. As you know, poor air quality, polluted air causes a lot of respiratory problems. People end up with things like bronchitis, you know, and um, asthma and other respiratory disorders. So if you are living in an environment um, that is extremely polluted, that's a serious disadvantage, which cannot be, of course, solved that uh, quickly. You would have to discuss that with your teacher in that case, and then do pranayama practices uh, which are not necessarily involving a higher intake of air. So they may not necessarily be, be more intense breathing practices, but also practices of pranayama which do not involve more breathing. But this would still be a serious handicap. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Could you describe uh, as best you can what the fourth pranayama should be like? <laughs> oh, yeah. Scott, that's a tough one. It, okay. What it should be like, um, well, hmm. Imagine yourself floating in the sea or, you know, in a swimming pool if you're... It's difficult to float in the sea, but uh, imagine you're floating in the... Uh, swimming pool. Now, it's a bit like that. Only you're not floating on water, but you experience being a part of consciousness, and this consciousness is in you, around you, everywhere, like you would be if you're floating on water. It's like being a fish in the water, you know, it's all around you. Similarly, that's the experience. 
So, um, like, I, I, like, for instance, last night, I, I kind of felt like almost like I was levitating during Yoga Nidra. Mm -hmm. So is that, that similar? Yes, that could be some something similar. And um, it depends on the practice of Yoga Nidra, what, what you're using. I mean, there are many Yoga Nidra practices uh, which people are doing, which are purely visualization practices. The technique... Um, so Yes, yeah, yes, okay. Uh, the technique of Yoga Nidra is different from the state of Yoga Nidra. But following those techniques, one can possibly experience glimpses of the fourth pranayama. Yes, that's possible. Okay. Uh, Meli, uh, it's obviously not possible for me to respond to all your private questions that you address to me. It is best you address your question to everybody <laughs> and not just to me because um, mostly I am not, not able to answer private messages. So the text that you can see, yes, says chapter 8 and 9. That's exactly what you're seeing. Yes, that's true. Because that's where we are in our online meeting. Okay, so um, where were we? We were at preparation, yes. So the preparation involves as well life choices. We have very often um, we had this experience when we did a retreat in uh, Rishikesh in December, January, where, where the idea to retreat is to have solitude, to focus on practice. But a couple of people were very keen on sightseeing and, you know, they went out all the time and did some sightseeing, which in itself is not a bad thing. But what happens when you keep going out and you keep putting a lot of new impressions in your mind? If you sit down and start practicing, all those impressions are going to come up and disturb you. So not surprising, you're not going to see much progress in this if you are leading a very externally oriented life. Which means that if you do want to really go deeper into these, you need to make certain life choices, lifestyle choices. And of course, not everybody is ready to do that. It does not mean that you need to uh, isolate yourself, but an excessive lifestyle can be counterproductive. So to experience really progress in life, you know, a quiet life, well-selected companionship, if I can put it this way, would be appropriate. How you use your energy, how you relate to people around you, this, this makes a big difference. The company you keep. So, progress into higher states of pranayam does require some changes also in lifestyle. Merely practice without changing anything else in your lifestyle is perhaps not going to be that useful. Okay, um, Shanta, this is still not available because this is the book I'm writing. It's called Mastering Pranayam. And so you're going to have to wait for it for at least another six months. And then you can get yourself a copy of it. And Shibu says, <laughs> I'm not interested in anything, nothing attracting to me. Okay, 
that's good. But on the other hand, Shibu, I would say that uh, isolating yourself completely, the other extreme may not always be uh, also the best thing to do because ultimately we are social beings. We need to find the right balance. Okay? So that's something to watch out for. Keeping the right company is, which is supporting, which is um, encouraging, is important. We call that satsang. That's why we, we say satsang is very important. Satsang does not mean just going and listening to the lectures of some teacher who is, uh, you know, lecturing in front of 10,000 people or something. Satsang means, sat is truth, sang is the, the group, the people, you are gathering uh, together in the name of truth. So people who are following this, you know, our tradition to be together. This is important, um, communicating with such people and they encourage each other. For example, if you keep the company of thieves, sooner or later, the police is going to come knocking at your door, even if you haven't stolen anything. So you see how important it is that you keep the right company. So these are important decisions that we need to make. Aranka says, difficult to be stable all the time. Yes, it is. It is. It, it is not, not easy to maintain or keep the balance. And if it were, not just for you, for everybody, if it were easy, uh, just a rule that you follow, everybody would be advanced yogis but we are not all advanced yogis and the reason for that is to, to balance this to maintain this balance is very hard sometimes it's called the razor's edge to get that balance is hard because it's always you know we tend to fall onto either extremes either we get into excessive external excessive internal, if we go too much outside, we dissipate our energy. If we go inwards, it, we, we can end up feeling very depressed and dull, which can also be very, very uh, difficult, right? So this is uh, hard to maintain, this balance, but it is one of the most important things to keep the right company, satsang. Another thing is associating with teachers who guide you, of course, we mentioned that earlier, to have the right guidance. So that will strengthen your discipline, keep you on track. A good teacher will caution you when he sees you going off track. So this is also very important. You see, there's so many factors. There's so many factors already, and I've, I've not even finished. One of the most important factors is sexuality and uh, how to conserve energy over there. Now, it doesn't mean that we all have to become celibates. We are not monks, nuns. And that's not even necessary to become a monk or a nun and become a celibate. Most of the time, celibacy can be rather forced and repressing the personality can be harmful. So these suppressions or repression can cause even disturbance in the pranic vehicles. Rather, having a healthy relationship with your partner is um, much uh, more, I'm struggling to find the right words now, 
is, is healthier, is something that will be useful in the long term to maintain a healthy lifestyle, mental balance, and um, help conserve your energies. You will not dissipate your energies. A promiscuous lifestyle, for example, can be also extremely harmful, just as suppression or repression is. Okay? Okay, Yes? Could I, just in addition, kind of in going along those lines, also, is, is there some elements of bhakti that are important? Um, you know, the, the, an emotional corollary to pranayama, uh, to experiencing the fourth prana? I mean, for instance, um, just attempting to be a really loving person in general, does that accentuate the, the development of, of that? Yes, of course, of course. You see, bhakti has sort of two meanings. Most people, when we talk about bhakti, understand bhakti to be singing devotional songs, prayer, which is also bhakti. These are, you can say, the um, tools or the instruments of that path. But these are external. Bhakti, internally, that, that bhava, that, that mood of devotion which arises spontaneously, that is like a nectar, that is like amrit, you know, and that is then also experienced as the fourth pranayama. You experience that when, as I told you, you are floating in the sea of consciousness, in the sea of prana, you experience that bhakti all around you, that is true bhakti. That is, that is not singing devotional songs, which is an external uh, practice or tool or technique, which would lead perhaps eventually to the experience of bhakti or devotion within. So bhakti, if you experience it and you can hold the bhava, you can hold that moment of devotion, that's that's wonderful. That will always take us deeper. That's what carries you to to the deepest levels of consciousness. So the regulation of all urges, and this is I made special mention of the sexual urge, but this is not the only urge that needs to be regulated. We also have sleep. Regular sleep patterns are very important. And I know that's getting increasingly difficult these days. The last thing we do when we go to bed is check our mobile. The first thing in the morning we do is check our mobile. <laughs> and... Um, if you don't put the mobile out of the bedroom, then it's, we, some of us check our, our messages even at 2 and 3 in the morning and uh, answer something on WhatsApp. So it's getting increasingly difficult to have regular sleep patterns. We tend to sit up watching movies or, or games or something or you have to get up really early, so you set an alarm to go to work. You end up getting too little sleep and um, build up a sleep deficit. You end up compensating on weekends and that ends in sloth. And um, the sleep habits, the sleep patterns are really irregular. It's hard, I know, to adjust in our modern life, but trying to bring in some regularity in our sleeping habits and getting a healthy amount of sleep is important. For most people, seven to eight hours of sleep is good. A good quality sleep. If you sleep too long, you might feel Thomasic, you might feel heavy, dull, you experience loss. If you sleep too little, 
you get irritable, you get impatient and snappy. So the nervous system is, is irritated. So maintaining that, again, is a balancing act. It's not easy. It has to be adjusted with family, with friends, with obligations that you have, um, for example, at work. Or people who are traveling have difficulties. It's not easy, but it's important to try to work out a good routine. That is important. These are the primitive fountains. Food, sleep, sex and self-preservation. So we talked about sleep, and regulating our sleeping habits. Try not to drink coffee or tea, for example, including green tea after 2 o'clock in the afternoon because it does affect sleeping patterns. You can drink herbal teas, you can drink gin ginger or you know ginger water or, or lime juice or whatever else, but just plain hot water, for example. But coffee, black tea, alcohol, uh, green tea, all affect sleeping patterns. Another um, of the primitive fountains, we, we spoke about sleep, the main one, the big one, the one that we always have so many questions about is food. What we eat has a tremendous impact on our uh, practice. A lot of people are not aware of the importance of this. We have three kinds of foods, sattvic, rajasic and tamasic. When we talk about diet here, we are not referring to healthy diet as in for normal healthy people. We are talking about diet with respect to yogic practice and attaining higher states of consciousness. So it is important then that the food we eat is not too oily, not too spicy. It's not tamasic. It should not be tamasic nor rajasic. As far as possible, it should be sattvic. Tamasic foods include things like frozen foods, processed foods, old stale foods, alcohol, all these are tamasic. Most fast foods are tamasic. Most foods that are kind of ready to eat are tamasic. So try as far as possible to eat freshly prepared healthy food. Rajasic foods are red meats, extremely oily food, uh, fried foods are generally also tamasic, so spicy foods, by spicy I mean like chilies, um, these are rajasic. The sattvic foods are grains like rice, lentils, especially the lighter dals. The moon dal, the chana bean dal, the, the moon beans, these are lighter. Um, milk was considered to be sattvic, but the way the industry produces milk today, I say that it would be tamasic because of the processing, because of the uh, homogenization, pasteurization, the, the antibiotics given to the cows, the treatment of the cows, the cows are completely stressed, um, the conditions that they live in, the whole process has made a beautiful sattvic product into something tamasic. So this is something that requires far more um, 
understanding, a little bit of um, you know, experimentation with food is required to see how the food impacts you. Once again, regular timings for food, for meals are required. Also, I know, very difficult to manage when you're traveling a lot. But if you're not traveling a lot, then that's something that you need to take care of, having regular food habits. So, what else do we have? The other is making sure that you do things in moderation. You know, even your practice should not be extreme, doing too much or too little. Try to be moderate. Don't tire out yourself. Uh, Matthias says, homemade, homegrown milk. You mean you have your own cow or so? Or do you mean <laughs> bio milk? Well, it's a bit better, bio milk, but even the organic milk is, um, while they don't have antibiotics and things like that, um, if you're sure that they have been well treated, if they are grazing gra you know, grass outside, then that's fine. But mostly that's also not the case. So I often say that it's better to have goat's milk or sheep's milk because it's not as industrialized as cow's milk. And if possible, um, you know, something you need to, to work out and see what you get available locally. In any case, when you do yoga practice, in the initial stages, you don't need much milk. Later stages, perhaps. Most people are not able to digest a lot of milk. You know? So that's something you need to see. There are so many people having milk, milk tolerances these days that you should be careful about how much milk, milk products you take in. Because excessive milk and milk products tends to cause mucus, which is a problem when you are um, doing breathing practices, you know, pranayams, certain pranayams, and this is obviously then uh, a nuisance when you are not really able to breathe properly, your nose is blocked. So these are some of the, the things that affect the pranayam that we need to look at how to, how to work these out. You know, one of the other things in diet is that you need to keep enough time between your food and your practice. So ideally we always say practice before meals. So always do a morning practice before breakfast, afternoon practice before lunch, evening practice before your evening meal and then not a very heavy evening meal and then fourth practice before going to bed at night if you're doing four practices. That's another thing, the number of how much time, effort you put into practice. Four speedy progress, four practices a day. If you're not in a hurry, and then two or even one. Moderation in food, how much you eat, you know, don't eat too much, don't eat too little. A lot of people like to torture themselves by fasting too much, extreme fasting, not good. Too much experimentation with diet can, you know, also harm the body, so take care of your body. These are all the little principles. The best kind of fast is the daily fast. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, the daily fast. Why is breakfast called breakfast? It comes from break fast. The daily fast is around 12 to 14 hours. So if you're having your breakfast at 8 in the morning, that means you should eat before around, you know, like 6 in the evening. So you have the entire night for the body to digest the food and then still enough time for your body to do some housekeeping. 
The body then has enough time to go into deeper purification, cleansing, which happens only when it doesn't, is not busy with digestion. So this is the daily fast. It's one of the best things that you can do if you want to progress in practice. Don't overeat and keep your daily fast. Okay. So any questions so far on the controlling the urges, the four primitive fountains or anything else regarding this lifestyle? Can we uh, control the self-preservation aspect, or how it, is that like something to be mindful about in the practice? Exactly. You then nobody can control it. Control is not possible. Yeah. The moment you talk about control, you're basically talking about suppression, repression. So it's about mindfulness. It's being aware and regulating these urges. And so we we say you know the celibacy can become an issue if you have not satisfied these desires, then celibacy ends up being hypocrisy, you know. So that why, that's why this can become a great issue and it is better to lead a, a healthy life, a life of moderation, than extremes. Same with the urge, other urges. We cannot control all our urges, even with food. We, if you have a desire to eat certain things, you know, sweets, chocolates, all these things, to a certain extent we can regulate and compensate. Certain things are extremely harmful, so if you end up being a drug addict, alcohol addict, obviously these are extremely harmful and you have to stop. You have to stop at some point of time. You have to go through that process. Or if you want to give up eating meat because... You have seen the effect of meat on your practice. Uh, vegetarianism is not 100% required, but you may observe the effect, the impact of meat in your meditation. It requires a certain finer um, understanding of the mind, requires greater observation and sensitivity to experience this difference but even there you need to compensate with with something so good food you know if it's vegetarian you don't need the non-vegetarian you know if you're having enough proteins and uh, having a good diet then you will not miss that so all these are things that can be managed So I guess the fourth fountain and the self-preservation fountain is only something you can observe and within yourself how you are uh, kind of, a, it's, it's like a reflex action more than a conscious thing, isn't it? Yes, well, fear is deep rooted in us, yeah. partly it's not only about self-preservation as in death, but many other aspects. We see uh, our fears when you have fear of growing old, fear of losing the loved ones, fear of um, loss of you know whatever is important to us. The fear is not merely about the physical death. The fear comes from the ego, the imagined death of a false identity. So when the false identity thinks, oh, uh, this is somehow harming me. It kicks in and you experience a tremendous fear. If you have the idea of being very young and wonderful for the rest of your life, and this idea is suddenly being questioned when you see your first gray hair, then that fear kicks in. That is also self-preservation. And what this means is that we are not flowing with nature, but we are fighting it. And this kind of um, fear is something we observe 
and at the unconscious level as these come up we let them go we are able to deal with this fear it doesn't completely go away but it loses its hold over you yeah yes aranga fear of losing old habits what are habits mostly they are coming from ahankara or from manas a manas that is develop certain habits like the indriyas have created certain habits you don't want to change them or from ego these are habits of how we behave and these are identities so ego does not want to change these and so these are deep rooted fears coming from you know that that's what the rigidity about is about but one thing is very clear that without this kind of preparation you are not going to experience and be able to be established in that fourth pranayam that is prana itself so no preparation no progress so one of the great secrets to mastering this final pranayam the fourth pranayam is the power of attention and it's learning to shift the flow of breath at will we have done nadi shodhanam and you can see it now we had done it the last times when we did it using vishnu mudra we talked about how you use this vishnu mudra where you bend your index finger and the middle finger and use the thumb as well as the ring finger to open and close the nostrils and we saw the three variations of nadi shodhanam and you always started with the active nostril exhaling and inhaling from the passive and that was the first variation and the second variation you exhaled from the active and inhaled from the active again and then you did it with the passive that was the second one and then third is inhaling exhaling from the active nostril and then after three rounds doing it with the passive nostril so these are the three variations and we always did it with vishnu mudra uh, matias does it with another mudra i don't know what mudra you're doing it with what is what is this other mudra and why do you have another mudra why do you need another mudra yes i know you cannot show it but what fingers are you using i i am not aware of any other mudra that one does or any other things that one does with nadi shodnam and i do not see any reason uh index finger ah i see okay that's that way um i only find that version far more uncomfortable to do yes it i i find that version far more uncomfortable to do because you need to put your hand much higher up your arm much much higher up okay and it is um it's very uh, uncomfortable and and how long can you keep your hand in that position but yes okay you can use that as well it is a different version of the vishnu mudra i personally would not recommend it because i think it's it's far more uh, difficult to keep your hand up if you use vishnu mudra in between you know you can also just keep your hand a little lower and it doesn't a uh, pain <laughs> if you put 
the ones that you and Patricia are talking about, your arm starts paining. What has been your experience with it? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So there may be other methods of doing it, and I do not recommend the other methods because this is the simplest method. I certainly do not think that using sticks is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, there are people who also use cotton wool and things like that. It's just making things more complicated. The reason why this is the simplest and easiest version, one is it's much more comfortable and two, you don't use anything external. You don't start using cotton wool and sticks and these kind of things because you're not going to do this for a long time. If you're planning to use this for a long time, fine, you can use all these external things. But we don't want to use this for a long time. You're just using the Vishnu Mudra method only to get the hang of the three different methods. We discussed in the session when we did Nadi Shodnam, how the changing of the nostril in variation one is there's much more movement. In the second variation, there's less movement, as you can see here. And in the third, there is very little movement. You're just spending most of your time with the active nostril and then with the passive nostril. And so the movement is decreasing. And once you have mastered this and you don't need for technical reasons or mechanical reasons you do not need to use your hands anymore you mastered that technique now you can focus purely on the point of focus which is the nostril point here and here just outside the active nostril and just outside the passive nostril, whichever is going to be, or the other way around. So that's going to be the focus of attention, right there, in, just in, in this bit here, going from here to here and here to here, from left nostril to right nostril and back. And that's where your focus should be. If you start using pure attention to do that because now you've let your hands be in jhana mudra on your feet on your knees and now use your mind only to pay attention to your the flow of breath from your right nostril just at the point outside the right nostril and then shift your attention to the flow of breath to your left nostril. You will observe a tendency to do this, to breathe in and go up. You will visualize, to breathe out, you will visualize going out. Do not do that. Do not do this. All you have to do is move from left to right to right to left in that point in front. That's all, all you need to do so that eventually you can rest here between the two nostrils. So you saw where it went. Now you have dropped your hands, fingers. You're not using any mudras. You're keeping your hands on your knees in jhana mudra. And all you're doing is using your mind, paying attention to the flow of the breath and moving your attention from active nostril to passive nostril, and from passive nostril to active nostril. Okay? What are you doing? You're training your attention to be one pointed. That's what you're doing. And this is the big secret of mastering pranayama. If you are able to do this, 
changing of the breath flow just by your attention, you will be able to attain the fourth pranayama. I don't cast if you can do more than three rounds. It's not necessary. It's not necessary to do more than three rounds because if you're inhaling and exhaling for a larger amount, length of time, you're going to be needing so much time to do all these practices that you are never going to get to your object of meditation. You're going to make it extremely complicated if you do more. There's already a lot happening here. If you look at it, look at the amount of things you need to master. You have to know which is your active nostril. You have to know which is your passive nostril. You have to move between these. You don't have to keep account. I have mentioned before that by the time you come to Nadi Shodhana, you should have elongated your breath Without count, you should have a feel of how to do this without a count, without counting. That you just have a feel for a long, smooth, silent breath without extended pauses. Okay. We said that was silent, without noise, without jerks, no extended pauses. And when you have mastered all this, then you're ready to start with Nadi Shodhanam. So here, when you're doing this now without Vishnu Mudra, you do not even need to count. You just have a feel of it and your mind, your attention is always at the nostril, feeling the flow of the nostrils. So Gotham asked, can we do this anytime you're free instead of just doing it through the practice? Well, <laughs> if you do it with Vishnu Mudra, then it's probably not a problem. And you can do it anytime you want. But there is a reason for doing it through the flow of the practice. That's why these sessions are called Mastering Pranayam. Because we want to master our Pranayam, right? And people are using various pranayam techniques in between any time they want. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But this is not a overview. This is not a systematic practice. If you just do it anytime, anywhere you want. We are talking here about uh, the ideal optimum solution. Of course, if you having difficulties integrating these things in your life, then one can take these kind of shortcuts and do it in between when you have free time. But then you should not expect results. You can do anything you want, but don't expect the results. And that's why People ask, why am I not experiencing the fourth pranayama? This is why. Because you don't have the time in your busy lives to go through the entire process from gross to subtle. You don't prepare the mind. You just jump into a very, very subtle practice. Okay, so keep that in mind, Gautam. You will... You can try it out, experience it for yourself. A session where you do a systematic practice and build it up and somewhere where you just jump in and, and see the result. Okay. Mat Matthias says, uh, I heard that we can also hold our attention on Nasi Kagra anytime. What do you mean by Nasi Kagra? This point here on the tip of the nose is that what you mean by Nasi Kagra? Then you mean here? Down, the nostrils. 
Yes. Anytime, yes, breath awareness you can do anytime. But as I said, don't expect any results. It's like people who study, you know, if you're studying for an exam and you were studying systematically going chapter wise and you go and, you know, go through the whole uh, syllabus, whatever you are studying systematically, it's a different approach. But if you study in between here and there in the train and the bus, you're distracted, you don't have time and you do a little here and you do a little there. What is the result going to be? Obviously not the same as sitting down, doing the whole study systematically. So that's going to be the result. That, that you are not going to um, progress very fast or that there is going to be no real progress at all. And then you will wonder, oh, why didn't I experience this? I'm doing this for three decades, some people say. But if you examine what they've been doing for three decades, they're doing exactly what I call cut and paste practices. Doing a little bit anywhere, anytime in between, without any kind of system. And without understanding why you're doing what you're doing. Alright, so that was the big secret and in the next session we are going to do another very very important practice Sushumna Kriya and that's what you talked about Matthias uh, breath awareness basically and so we will be doing Sushumna Kriya and Sandhya, but I don't know if we'll finish both. But we will at least start with Sushumna Kriya next time. We probably will require the entire session for Sushumna Kriya itself, just for that alone. Okay, so I hope that you um, enjoy the rest of your Sundays. And it was nice having all of you here. Bye bye everyone. Bye everyone. Yes. Harika, thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Manoj. Bye. Gautam. Bye. Devi. Bye. Shabu. Bye. Himashri. <laughs> bye. Matthias. <laughs> Patricia, oh, so many people said bye in the meantime. I didn't see that. Okay, bye, everyone.